Hi everyone, welcome to our channel. Today's topic is the bronchial tree. We'll start off with a brief description of its anatomical structure. In order to picture the bronchial tree, we have to imagine the trachea as the tree trunk, and the main bronchi with all their ramifications as the crown of the tree, all upside down. It is important to classify these branches because it really helps to describe and understand the anatomy of the lungs and also their vascularization pattern. The first branches are two, and they are called the main bronchi, entering the root of the lungs. They are slightly different in length and orientation, as well as their branches. In fact, the right lung gives off three secondary or lobar bronchi, whereas the left one ends in two lobar bronchi. These secondary branches establish the lobes of the right and the left lung. Then we have a third ramification from the lobar bronchi. They are also called segmental bronchi as they form specific zones or pulmonary segments in the lung parenchyma. From a clinical point of view, this is very important as each one is independent in their blood supply. The further ramifications results in large bronchioles, dividing the large parenchyma in lobules, and in fact, they're also called lobular bronchi, then, furthermore, into intralobular and terminal bronchioles. At this point, the bronchial tree terminates, forming directly the lung parenchyma as the terminal bronchioles open up in multiple respiratory bronchioles, each with many of their other ducts and sacs. Here is where the gas exchange occurs. The trachea is a T-shaped semi-rigid tube that descends from the larynx in the neck to the mediastinum. It is 10 to 13 centimeters long and it ends with a bifurcation called carina into the two main bronchi at the level of T4. If we take a cross section of the trachea, we can see that it's an hollow organ whose wall is made by many layers or tunica. The closest to the lumen is the tunica mucosa, made by a lining epithelium resting on a thick basement membrane or lamina propria. In particular, the lining epithelium in pseudo-stratified columnar and ciliated, with other cell types occasionally interposed. This can be unicellular mucous glands, called goblet cells, unicellular endocrine glands, called granular cells, chemoreceptors or brass cells, as they possess microvilli as an apical specialization. In continuity with the lamina propria, we have a connective tissue called submucosa, containing glands. Below this layer, we can notice, depending on where we take the section, a cartilage layer, a fibroelastic layer, or even both. In fact, the trachea contains about 20 cartilaginous rings kept together by a fibroelastic tissue to prevent the structure from collapsing and also to let air flow into the lungs through the bronchial tree. Note that posteriorly there is no cartilage, but a thicker smooth muscle layer to support expansion and recoil during respiration, and also to allow certain mobility during the passage of food into the esophagus. Finally, the trachea is not enveloped in a serosa, but in a connective tissue capsule called tunica adventitia. The microanatomy of the bronchi is very similar to the trachea, although we can notice some important differences. First, the bronchi are smaller in diameter. Second, the cartilaginous layer completely encircles the lumen of the bronchi, and as they branch into lobar and segmental bronchi, the cartilage becomes more scattered and also thinner. Third, we can notice a thin layer of smooth muscle between the lamina propria and the submucosa in order to give more elasticity to the overall structure. Bronchioles are distinguishable in a cross-section because they do not possess the cartilaginous ring nor the submucosal glands. In addition to this, we can observe a thinner, simple columnar epithelium with sparse goblet cells, and a new cell type appears, clara cells. Their role is to release a lipoproteic fluid called surfactant in order to avoid the bronchioles collapse. Furthermore, 
We can notice a layer of smooth muscle controlling the diameter of the tube and also its resistance. Neuroendocrine cells controlled by the autonomic nervous system are responsible for regulating the bronchial muscle tone. Alveoli are very thin, light spherical sacs filled with air and surrounded by a capillary network. The respiratory membrane is so thin that the gas exchange occurs only by diffusion. Alveoli are lined by a simple squamous epithelium that is formed by type 1 neonocytes and by specific cells that appear less flattened, which are called type 2 neonocytes. Type 2 neonocytes release a surfactant-like molecule. Once again, the function of the surfactant is to avoid the collapse of the alveoli. So, to make a quick recap, some components of the bronchial tree decrease with the branching, such as cartilage and glands in the submucosa, in fact, they disappear starting from the bronchioles, goblet cells, which stop at the level of the tertiary bronchi, and cilia, as they decrease in quantity after the tertiary bronchioles and disappear from the respiratory bronchioles. The lining epithelium changes morphologically, becoming thinner and thinner going down the bronchial tree. In fact, it maintains the characteristics of the respiratory epithelium in the trachea and the main bronchi. Then we notice a change into simple columnar epithelium in the segmental bronchi, simple cuboidal in the respiratory bronchioles, and finally, simple squamous in the alveoli. Some components are maintained in the branching, such as the smooth muscle layer and the elastic fibers. Smooth muscle cells are present in a fixed quantity until the tertiary bronchi. Then they start to decrease, but never really disappear. Elastic fibers, instead, do not decrease in the bronchial tree. In fact, we can notice a fewer quantity in the alveoli only. They maintain the airways open, avoiding their collapse. When the elastic fibers decrease in number, we have a pathological condition of the lungs called emphysema 